we confess to you, O Lord, that we are in the midst of high and holy mysteries that are beyond human explanation, and yet you call us to speak, to declare, to affirm, to acknowledge, to receive. O oh Lord, release grace that we with these mere human failings might acknowledge that which you are doing and say yes with all of our hearts. O oh, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Flannery O'Connor, writing about the very events that we heard read in the gospel, as well as crucifixion and resurrection, said this, the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it emotionally. She had that kind of terse way about her. If you've ever read her stories, they're both starkly truthful and occasionally hair-raising. She was one who never, ever shied away from the worst of human drama, but always using it as an instrument to say things that she felt her audience, um, myself included now these days, certainly need to hear. Because you see, this week that began last Sunday with the triumphal ent entry is really a, a, a series of assaulting confrontations. The triumphal entry is hardly the stuff of nursery rhymes. It is a direct confrontation with both the political and the religious authorities of Jerusalem. The very shouts of Hosanna were the cry of messiahship. No longer was there the messianic secret. Tell no one what you have seen or heard. It is an open declaration that the king is coming in to claim his own. The money changers are cast out of the temple. The fig tree is cursed and withered. And I have to tell you that as a reader of these stories, when I get to this part, I feel like I'm on a roller coaster holding on for dear life. Because you see where this is going, and I, I know it, is that that confrontation is coming straight to my door. I, ca I cannot read these stories as an innocent bystander. This is about the salvation of the human race, the transformation of all called to repentance, to lay down an old life and to willingly take up a new one. And the more I know about it, the more it frightens me at its cost, even though the fruit of the price is extraordinarily sweet. Put yourself in this room where the gospel reading, the story is told. It's just a normal dinner. Nobody knows anything's about to happen, cataclysmic, terrifying, and life-changing. Passover is just on the horizon. They're eating and they're talking, and in the midst of it, Jesus does something that they absolutely have never seen him do before. He stands upright in the middle of the meal during supper, John says, and he takes off all of his clothes. What would you say if that happened at a dinner party at your house? All that's left is a loincloth. Walks over, takes the towel set aside for the servants, wraps it around his waist, gets the basin, the pitcher, and begins to wash the feet of his disciples. Nobody says anything. Nothing is recorded. I, they're shocked. They are embarrassed. They, they don't even know what to say. What is he doing? This isn't for a rabbi to do. Even a Jewish servant could refuse to do this. The only one who had to do it, if asked, was a Gentile servant. This puts Jesus literally at the bottom rung. 
the only thing I can even begin to relate to is the fear that I felt when I was sitting in a classroom knowing that I hadn't done my homework and terrified that the teacher was going to call upon me. I mean, here he is, and, and they're just going, oh, I hope, I hope he just skips me. But he is relentless. The scripture says that Jesus skipped no one. Peter is, of course, appalled and says so. Lord, you shall never wash my feet. Oh, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And the back and forth begins to happen. And what Jesus is actually saying to Peter, and of course, and to us, the readers, is, you can't have a relationship with me on your terms. It has to be on mine. Oh, but God, that's, ex that's exactly what I do. I read the scriptures that I like. I try to forget the other ones that I don't like or even there. I can even find sort of facile ways to intellectually devalue them as it relates to the rest of the canon of Scripture. I, I can find a way to shape myself according to my aspirations and yet still hope that I'm good enough to call myself a believer that, that I know Jesus accepts me just as I am and so he knows the charade of the, that I'm playing maybe far better than I do. But I know he knows and I, I know I'm not rejected. And then this word, unless you, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Unless you allow my spirit, all that I am, to penetrate into the very deepest fiber of your being, unless you allow me to handle the very parts of who you are that are the most sensitive to intrusion, unless you allow me to get your, my fingers in between your toes and touch the places where you would never want anybody to touch, it's got to be, Peter, on my terms, not yours. Martin Luther put it this way, unless a man is nothing, God can make nothing of him. And what I see happening in this story is that that's precisely what Jesus is doing. I can't control this Jesus. He does things that I don't like at all. I, I, I want Jesus to be sort of like Superman, you know, coming in valiant swooping me up and saving me out of my difficulty and trouble, calling me to my heroic best, rising to the occasion. Yes, I will follow you anywhere. And even though that's exactly what Peter said, and it got him into a whole host of trouble, there is a part of me that tremendously wants to walk in the footsteps of a hero. But as I sit in that upper room and I look up, I don't see him. I have to look down. Because what we see in Jesus is a God who bends the knee and washes feet. Can I say yes to that Jesus? as well as the Jesus who is the extraordinary teacher, the Jesus who casts out demons, the, demons who, the Jesus who refutes the Pharisees, who rises victoriously from the dead, all of those things that cause me to say, yes! Do I want to be one with one who serves in the most menial ways and then calls me, mandates me, you see, to serve precisely in the very same way, to get my fingers between the toes, the dirtiest parts of other people's lives, to bend the knee where I could well be kicked in the face, to serve knowing that I may or may not be so well received by the one in whose feet, that whose feet I hold. Do I want to say yes to that Jesus? Oh, uh, that challenges me at the very core of my own autonomy. Mm, but he keeps saying, 
Unless you are washed, you have no part of me. See, it turns the Seder on its head. The very careful reading that we heard earlier of the book of Exodus is literally a series of commands with life and death consequences. Unless the blood of the lamb, not the blood of a cow, the blood of a lamb is on the lintel and the doorpost, the angel of death will pass by and the firstborn will die. There is no second chances. And so a very meticulous set of commandments are given so that the, not only in terms of the way the lamb is to be slaughtered, but the way it's to be eaten, it's all about obedience that God might favor you with life. This is just the opposite. I'm not called in this passage to be heroic. I'm called to submit, to face my own empty inadequacies, to do the thing that is being asked of me, to do what Luther says, to literally be driven to the point of saying to him, I cannot do this, oh God. I cannot. Showing me in a way that I never wished I knew how wrapped up in ambition and pride and needing other people to think well of me, the, want, the desire to impress that's so much a part of the warp and woof of all of who we are, the driven competitiveness, competitiveness to make the world go the way I want it, and you get terribly irritated when people get in the way. Think of how you are when you're in traffic and what happens inside of your brain, even if you never ever say it out loud. We do, you see, want the world to go our way. And Jesus says here, no, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And that drives me to my knees. Saying, oh Lord, you know my heart. You know I want heroism, not servanthood. I want to be impressive. I don't want quiet, servile love. But, oh Lord, if you love me enough to take the dirty feet that I have, and to wash them with the very holy water that you pour upon it, holy because it is yours. If you are willing to touch the deepest parts of who I am, what else can I say but yes to that? What else can I do in the face of a God who kneels and washes my feet, but in fact weep with gratitude? because I know the weaknesses of my own heroism, how swiftly my desires change, even my best desires, when they run at cross purposes with the other desires that are in my heart. And to know that God knows me even better than I know myself, Lord, where else can I go, really, except to you? I have no place else. So Monday Thursday is an invitation, first of all, into intimacy with the Holy One of Israel. You see, that's exactly what will happen when we receive the bread and the wine. Even if you don't come up for foot washing, when you extend your hands and the bread gets placed in your hands and you ingest that bread in your system, what are you doing except receiving grace into the very darkest parts of who you are, touching the places inside of you that you wish weren't even there, under the lockbox, hoping nobody else will ever know. You're saying in the very receiving of communion, come in light and bring light into those places of darkness. Set me free from the bondages of evil. Put condemnation aside and bring all of me into the light that I might know joy, real joy. You see, the washing of the feet and the receiving of the Eucharist are in fact 
two different ways of expressing the very same truth. Life mediated through a serving Savior. That we might, by a miracle, only a miracle, not our heroic resolve, receive from him such as is necessary that we might be changed and slowly but surely take upon ourselves that same call to serve. Love one another as I have loved you, Deacon Carol Lynn read. Not nice, merely, but as I have loved you. So tonight, before a kneeling Savior, I am driven to my knees. Before a love that will not let me go, I can do nothing else but say yes, even though the fears inside of me would want with all of my might to maintain my own autonomy. God, in his love, reaches past that autonomy with a love that claims me as his own. And yes, I agree with Flannery O'Connor. It is the, these events that, in fact, I'm not sure I've got the stomach for, but I have nowhere else to go, and so I go with him. Will you? Will you go with him? Will you say yes to the invitation? for Jesus to touch the deepest parts of who you are, to grasp you as his own, and begin to pour into you the kind of light and life that sets us free. That is Monday Thursday. And so we go, because we have no place else to go. Lord, where else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Welcome to Maundy Thursday. Amen.